So I'm going to talk to you. Um, can you hear me all right? Anybody? Yes, can we can hear you. hear you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you tonight about how at Star Ranch we protect and promote Southern California wildlands. But first, um, the full-time staff at Audubon Star Ranch include, of course, the, uh, my husband, the manager, Pete DeSimone, who works on infrastructure, IT, and admin. Matt Scary, my longtime field supervisor, who works on land management, and me. So Audubon Star Ranch is a 4,000 acre preserve in the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains in southeast Orange County. The ranch protects the unique patchwork or mosaics of habitats typical of lower elevations in Southern California. Two Mediterranean climate shrublands, chaparral and coastal sage scrub, oak and riparian woodland, and native grassland. On Star Ranch, we try to take a research-based, sustainable approach to land management. Since 1997, I've advocated for non-chemical weed control and innovative approaches to restoration. We try to plant climate-smart, drought-tolerant, fire-resistant, and resilient species. The South Coast ecoregion, LA, Orange, and San Diego counties, is a globally recognized hotspot of biodiversity and supports more endemic, that means found only here, plant and animal species and more imperiled species than any other ecoregion in the United States. And I guess I should have told you, I'm gonna talk about 40 minutes. I hope that's okay. The Star Ranch Western boundary is adjacent to continuous suburbia from San Diego to the south to LA to the north. But to our east and south are 140,000 acres of contiguous wildlands, Cleveland National Forest and Casper's Wilderness Park. The original inhabitants of our land were Native Americans. And this is taken from a history of Star Ranch by intern Molly Bloomer a long time ago in 1998. The Spanish missionaries renamed the tribes for the nearest missions. The Juaneño were named for Mission San Juan Capistrano and Luiseño were named for Mission San Luis Rey. But there were originally the Akaj Chemem tribe were the Juaneño and the Payom Kawishiam tribe, the Luiseño. From 1928 to 1963, Star Ranch was a 10,000-acre cattle ranch owned by Eugene and Applin Star. They had about 1,200 head of cattle grazing on their 10,000 acres, and the buildings are historic for Southern California, built in the 1930s, and the kids love the bunkhouse where the cowboys lived. Um, the stars passed away within about a year of each other in 1963, and the land went into a foundation. And in 1973, 4,000 acres went to the National Audubon Society. The south 5,000 acres were bought by Orange County Parks. And the north 1,000 went into private ownership and, as you know, are now a gated golf course community to our north. These are Star Ranch boundaries today. Here you see to the west, continuous suburbia and wildlands to the east and south. This is the view from our highest point, 1,752 feet to the west towards the ocean. And this is in the exact same spot towards the east. So we're gonna begin with a brief look at the vegetation and animals each habitat Star Ranch protects. So here you can see the patchwork quilt of habitats on the big riparian woodlands, Bell Canyon, North South Canyon, on the ancient uplifted river terraces, needle grass grassland, on these steep slopes and in the foreground, coastal sage scrub and oak woodland in the washes between. Um, So we protect about 300 acres of chaparral, mostly on north facing slopes. It's less drought adapted, of course, than coastal sage scrub, which in these ridges are, is on adjacent south facing slopes. 
when the kids go up in a trail that overlooks these ridges, they just, they say stripes. It's really interesting. Semi-air treblands have the potential to sequester more carbon than tropical rainforest under some conditions. And chaparral is California's most extensive native plant community and extends into Oregon. The shrubs have leathery leaves, they're six to nine feet tall, and they're adapted to fire if a fire is not too intense or frequent. Here's a rich chaparral ecosystem in Southern California that was converted to non-native weeds from repeated prescribed burning. <laughs> We protect about 2,063 acres of coastal sage scrub, shrubs that are highly adapted to our semi-arid climate. The shrubs of coastal sage scrub have softer leaves in chaparral. Many of them have kind of a nice minty fragrance, fragrance. Although the literature describes this habitat as three to nine feet, foot tall shrubs, they're mostly, I think, shoulder to waist high and also are adapted to fire if the fire is not too intense or frequent. Coastal sage scrub provides habitat for over 100 rare, threatened, and endangered plant and animal, animal species, the most famous of which you see on upper screen left, the coastal California gnat catcher. The worldwide gnat catcher distribution follows the worldwide distribution of coastal sage scrub, which you see here in purple on the map, from southern into northern Baja, California. Cactus scrub, a type of coastal sage scrub, provides habitat for the coastal cactus wren on screen right, a California species of special concern. So the net catcher has a really cute um, song. It sounds kind of like a kitten to me. Coastal sage scrub provides habitat for the Southern Pacific rattlesnake, California fuchsia, white sage. We protect about 500 acres of native grassland, dominated as, of course, you all know, by purple needlegrass, nacella or stipo, I can't remember which it is right now, pulchra, our California state grass. Here you can see its purple needles in flower. And it forms the a bunch grass matrix with annual grasses between the bunches. In April, we begin surveys for two songbird indicators of grassland habitat quality, western meadowlark and on screen right, grasshopper sparrow. The crew and I, rec I train the crew and I've learned over time to recognize these birds by sight and sound. And the grasshopper sparrow is a California species of special concern, and it sounds kind of like a grasshopper. Grasshopper sparrow. Didn't hear that. Oh, I heard grasshopper sparrow. Mm -hmm. Grassland birds have suffered the greatest bird declines of any terrestrial biome since 1970, with a 53% reduction in their overall population. And grasses have an enormous capacity for carbon storage and remove more carbon from the atmosphere than any other ecosystem in America. In an old agricultural pond in a native grassland during wet years, we see this California species of special concern, western spadefoot toads. And the crew are just out, and their rather large tadpoles are numerous in the pond this year. We protect a five-mile stretch of 15-mile-long Bell Creek, which flows eventually to the ocean. It's one of the last remaining pristine streams in Southern California. University and agency researchers track rare fish, aquatic invertebrates, and even a new species of alga was found in Bell Creek. Mountain lions move through their huge home ranges in the canyons where creeks flow. We protect about 300 acres of oak woodlands, which are dominated by one upland tree species, 
Coast Live Oak, Quercus agrifolia, provide habitat for acorn woodpeckers and bobcats. These are the big three inland cons uh, conservation issues in the Southern Cala re region from my point of view. Extreme weather events, intense rainfall and extended drought, tree mortality from tree pests and the disease they carry, and wind-driven frequent and large-scale fires which can type convert native shrublands to weedy, fire-prone landscapes. As I discuss Star Ranch programs, I'll tell you how we integrate our work into addressing these major conservation issues. Our work focuses on three major program areas, applied research, land management, and education. And if we're known for anything, we're known for innovation, integration, and sustainability. An example of innovation in land management is uh, strip planting. We pioneered a new type of coastal sage scrub restoration that uses one to two meter, three to six feet wide strips that run along slope contours for shrub planting with unplanted areas or buffers between. And this method has been adopted by partners in some large Orange County preserves. We also use no chemicals and we do use adaptive or research-based land management, which I'll describe. But first, Star Ranch land management has influenced practice on over 200,000 acres of preserved land from Ventura to San Diego counties through visitation and solicited advice. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has called our work cutting edge, and Dr. Katie Suiting, a well-known restoration ecologist, has called our project groundbreaking. The heart of our land management work are the seasonal staff. They're recent college grads from all over the country. I've hired and mentored over 200 since 1997. There are two fundamental and interrelated land management practices on Star, Star Ranch, non-chemical weed control and accepting some non-natives in hybrid ecosystem. An example of innovation in land management and applied research is the concept of hybrid ecosystems or accepting some non-natives or weeds into otherwise native ecosystems. Because it's not a well-known concept, I'm going to give you the backstory of hybrid ecosystems. So the Audubon mission is to conserve and restore natural ecosystems, focusing on birds, other wildlife, and their habitats for the benefit of humanity and the Earth's biological diversity. And my goal as Star Ranch land manager is to protect and restore native habitat for birds and other wildlife. Oops. And challenges I face towards reaching that goal are to restore and monitor our rare native habitats, coastal sage scrub, needlegrass grassland, riparian woodland, to monitor effects on birds and other wildlife, and non-native species control. Researchers suggest that during initial phases of a new non-native introduction that managers go for it, remove and that relies on early detection. But for established non-native populations, these researchers advise us to assess impacts to biodiversity, ecosystem function, and resilience. But managers need parameters we can measure. I don't have the time or resources to measure biodiversity or ecosystem functions like nutrient cycling and decomposition and resilience or how an ecosystem returns after a disturbance like fire requires long time and large spatial scales to measure. But there was an ecosystem function or dynamic process in this paper that I thought we could deal with, biotic-biotic inter interactions. For example, habitat provision for observable wildlife. And we can ask, does the established non-native have positive or neutral effects? and if so, accept it into a hybrid ecosystem. Though there are technical definite definitions for these terms, for our purposes, a hybrid ecosystem is composed of both non-natives or weeds and natives, whereas the more well-known concept, novel ecosystem, 
is non-native or weed dominated, and that's from human-caused disturbance. At Star Ranch, we currently have low human-caused disturbance and stress. Grazing ended in 1963, and the last major fire was in 1980. And we have relatively low nitrogen deposition, mostly from air pollution. So we consider hybrid, not novel, ecosystems. So we ask, does the established non-native have positive or neutral effects on observable wildlife, which for us are songbirds and small mammals? And if so, accept it into a hybrid ecosystem. So why songbirds? Well, you know, they're easily detected, they're readily distinguished to species level, and their data are widely comparable due to standardized field methods. Small mammals can exert strong influence on vegetation patterns in Southern California, but their abundances are highly variable. So back to hybrid ecosystems and how I make decisions on accepting non-natives into a hybrid ecosystem for coastal sage scrub restoration. Here is some of our qualitative monitoring or photo points in a coastal sage scrub restoration site this is baseline. The site was dominated by non-native artichoke thistle, a spiny weed with a taproot that can extend six to nine feet into the soil. And our data show provides poor habitat for songbirds and Birds small mammals. Hey, Peter, are you guys getting feedback? Yes, getting feedback. There, that was, it should be gone now. He had, he left his iPad, and was making strange sounds. Okay, so good. we've got baseline, and now um, over a series of three experiments, um, we learned how to control artichoke thistle without chemicals, and after one season of non-chemical treatment, we can reduce its cover in most sites by 95%. So this on screen, upper screen right. Hey, Peter, I was getting feedback, so I had to turn that off. Um, sorry, in upper screen right is the same site at the end of the first season of artichoke thistle control. The second year, we began coastal sage scrub restoration. And here you see the strips with the unplanted buffers in between. My colleagues made fun of me at first, and I do admit they look a little strange, but along comes a good rainfall season and seedlings here in, with the blue flags, uh, California sagebrush, Artemisia californica, have moved into the buffers from the planted shrub strip above. So from the end of the first season of weed control to the seventh season of coastal sage scrub restoration, the site looks like this. Since 1999, in 650 of the 700 acres targeted, artichoke thistle cover has been reduced by 95% after one season of treatment. The crew and I work in polygons, as you see in the map on screen left. And on screen right, you see how the five-person field crew moves through a polygon together to make sure we catch early stages of weeds. The crew, for some unknown reason, has dubbed this process flying, but it's really just early detection and rapid response star ranch style. In a new restoration sites, the crew controls the worst forb or non-grass weeds, mostly thistles. And about 10 years ago, I asked the crew to get rid of it, to get rid of the annual grasses, whose seed banks are short-lived, so that after two seasons, they were gone. But before we could plant coastal sage scrub species, a much worse forb or non-grass species, English plantain, Plantago lanceolata, erupted out of seed banks. We put in experiments and learned how to control it, but it dawned on me that sometimes managers risk replacing one weed with a less manageable weed species. So I developed a new strategy, 
based on the fact that controlling annual grasses can mean risking a less manageable dicot, forb, or non-grass invasive, and on the fact that I should have known from our own research we know that native shrubs colonize adjacent annual grasslands. So the new strat strategy is to target non-native dicot, forb, or non-grass invasives, to leave non-native annual grasses, and to monitor the effects on native plants and wildlife. So here are some of our monitoring data from the buffers or unplanted area between the shrub strips from three different coastal sage scrub restoration sites, site two, site three, site five. The y-axis is total native cover, really almost all shrub species. And the color bars are years of restoration. The blue bars are the first year of restoration, green bars are the second year, and so on. And what we found was a nice trend of increasing shrub cover over time in all three sites without the crew doing any non-native annual grass control. Here are data taken over a restoration chrono sequence. These are data taken in one season, in our case in sites of first, second, fourth, fifth, and sixth season of coastal sage scrub restoration. The top graph is total native cover, mostly shrubs, which increased from younger to older restoration sites. And the bottom graph is non-native annual grass cover, which showed an overall trend of decrease from younger to older restoration sites without the crew doing any non-native annual grass control. We also had an ornithologist who took songbird data over the same restoration chrono sequence using spot mapping. The top graph is bird species richness or number of bird species, and the bottom graph is songbird abundance or number of individuals. And both showed a nice tight, tight increasing trend from younger to older restoration sites with the turnover in later years to species more typical of mature coastal sage scrub like the lazuli bunting. These are data from live trapping and release of small mammals over time from a restoration site in the red bars and pristine or natural coastal sage scrub in the blue bars. The y-axis is the number of captures, mostly rodents, native mice, and wood rats. The blue bars, the natural coastal sage scrub, showed the fluctuations that are typical of small mammal populations. So let's take a look at the red bars, the coastal sage scrub restoration sites. Let's start on screen left. Here, artichoke thistle control begins, then um, coastal sage scrub restoration begins. And by the fourth season of coastal sage scrub restoration, we have a nice increasing trend in number of native small mammal captures with a turnover in later years to species typical of closed canopy coastal sage scrub like the brush mouse. So we began to ask, why do non-native annual grasses dis disappear in restoration sites? Could these animals play a role? But first, let's take a look at natural coastal sage scrub patterns and processes, what we know from Star Ranch research. I did an analysis of coastal sage scrub adjacent to grassland in aerial photos taken back through time from 1993 back to 1945 and I found a pattern of shrublands moving into grasslands. And then in coastal sage scrub adjacent to grassland, we did small mammal live trapping and also rabbit scat transects from coastal sage scrub into the ecotone between the two habitat types that's dubbed the bear zone by researchers because it's mostly bare ground, then into the adjacent grassland. And we find how higher numbers of small mammals, mostly native rodents and rabbits in the shrubland and in the ecotone than in the adjacent grassland. You see results from a cage experiment down at the bottom. And the cage experiment that I'm showing you is from the ecotone. And these were cages that excluded herbivores or animals that eat plants. And we found significantly higher um, grass and forb or non-grass cover under cages 
than in uncaged plots. So I hypothesized that small mammals and rabbits were taking shelter in the coastal sage scrub, only venturing out one to two meters, three to six feet, eating the delicious grasses and forbs, then running back into the shrubs to avoid predators. And in the process, they clear the ecotone to bare ground so that our small seeded light requiring coastal sage shrubs then colonize the grassland as a front. I realize that natural patterns and processes might apply to restoration sites. And after five years or more, I began observing what I thought were astonishing bare areas adjacent to planted shrub strips. So in top screen left, you see strip, strip, and then grasses in the buffers in between because the crew removes the non-grass weeds, mostly thistles. And then on top right are eight seasons later, and this is the top strip here at the top of the photo and a three to six foot wide bare area and further out are weeds. Then on bottom left in the fall now, so it's drier, you see a strip, strip and dried annual grasses in between. And then on bottom right, five seasons later, believe it or not, these are the same strips and we didn't make the bare ground. So we asked, do natural coastal sage scrub patterns and processes work in restoration sites? Do herbivores create bare areas later colonized by shrubs? And we asked, is there an effect of herbivores on non-native species in buffers? And we did a number of experiments, but let's take a look at an exclosure experiment or a cage experiment. Um, I had a great research assistant for a couple of years, Mickey Tang, who did most of this work. She's now a doctoral student at UC Davis. So in a number of coastal sage scrub restoration sites, Mickey put cages, as you see in the photo at the bottom, in the bare ground in the unplanted buffers between the planted shrub strips. She also placed on cage control plots, and the graph shows some of her results. The green bars are for um, inside cages or exclosures, and the gray bars are control plots. From left to right, Mickey found significantly higher total herbaceous or non-shrub density and annual grass density under cages than in control plots. Mickey left the cages in place for two years. Then before removing them, she put a motion triggered camera in place and found that rabbits took shelter in the shrub strips and came out to eat the yummy green stuff. So we thought if rabbits are eating the green stuff during the day, perhaps native rodents are eating non-native grass seeds at night when they're active. So she placed seeds of two different weedy grasses on sandpaper in the bare ground of the buffers. And sure enough, a little native mice, Paramiscus species, we couldn't identify the species from the videos, came out from the shrub shelter to eat the grass seeds. So we hypothesize that mature shrubs in planted strips provide shelter and predator avoidance for rodents, rabbits, and birds in our videos who consume weedy grasses, forbs, and their seeds in the buffers between the strips and native shrubs colonize or move into the resulting bare ground in the buffers to fill the site in. So our conclusions for coastal sage scrub restoration are because of neutral effects on non-native annual grasses on wildlife, we accept them. But the hybrid ecosystem evolves into a native shrub dominated system over time. How that happens? Herbivory by rodents, birds, and rabbits. Okay, a little bit about integration. Our research is integrated not only into land management, but also into education. After a post-pandemic hiatus, education programs will be reactivated by a newly funded seasonal ornithologist in 2024. Star Ranch Field Ecology programs give kids and adults a hands-on experience in what it's like to be a wildlife biologist. Ecology programs during the school year pose a research question. On the left, they're asking, 
if there's a difference in ground dwelling invertebrates, small mammals, or soil chemistry in native compared with weedy grasslands. Spring and summer Star Ranch junior biologists involve kids at ages 8 to, 8 to 13 in simulated or actual wildlife and habitat research alongside staff biologists. Here's some of our ecology programs, and uh, Zach, our seasonal ornithologist, has offered these this spring. Um, cougars, bobcats, and coyotes is our large mammal program. The kids learn tracks, uh, and adults, we have adult versions also. They learn the mammal tracks, then um, the biologist puts out scent stations, and that's why it fine gypsum with scent lure on a rock in the middle, and the animals are attracted, and they leave tracks for the kids or adults to identify. In stream biosurvey, we ask if there's a difference in creek macro, macro invertebrates or bugs in ripple, riffles compared with pools, and they actually do find a difference. We also have light versions of our programs, and here kids are just having fun exploring in Bell Creek with nets. And here are some of the amazing invertebrates that they find. They're mostly aquatic forms of terrestrial invertebrates. Summer Star Ranch junior biologists over three weeks take the kids through my concept of the research process. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the first week, they just have fun with techniques biologists use and get to know Star Ranch ecosystems. They do small mammal trapping. They look at insects and plants under microscopes. They explore in the creek, and we end the week with an evening program for families. Week two, the kids ask different research questions every day. What do star ranch owls eat? By dissecting owl pellets. And with using scent stations, they ask if there's a difference in large mammals at the edge adjacent to the homes compared with the interior away from development. And the creek program asks, is there a difference in creek bugs in polluted compared with unpolluted water? And we end the week with an owl survey, asking what owls live in Bell Canyon. So to teach the scientific method, we had to simplify the language, and we worked really hard on this. So there are four basic steps. Ask a question, choose your methods, get your data, and look at your data and think. Week three, we spend the entire week on a mini research project and camp one night at the ranch. And the kids, if we've had a good rainfall year, love to swim in a creek pool. Spring junior biologists meet on four consecutive Wednesdays. We meet with, a, we work with a lot of homeschool families or Saturdays to do mini research projects. One year, the kids looked at survival on the edge and the research question came from the conservation biology concepts of fragmentation and edge effects. Are bird nests more likely de to be predated in habitats close to houses or in habitats farther from houses, edge versus interior? So the biologists bought fake bird nests at Michael's and wired them into shrubs in the coastal sage scrub on the edge adjacent to the houses and away from houses in interior coastal sage scrub. Then they bought quail eggs and they placed them in the nests. The biologists wanted to see some of the possible egg predators, so they, so they put an egg on a track plate and put a video cam in place. can hear them crunch it. The kids were very excited to have this large mammal walk by their camera. During the school year, we offered a team program for 14 to 18 year olds who met monthly for research and service projects and field trips to the amazing wildlands of Southern California, including the mountains, deserts, coasts, and forests. These are the field trips from back in 2016 when I had a wildlife biologist, Scott Gibson, who is a inveterate backpacker. So he took the kids on great field trips. 
up the tram to the San Jacinto Mountains, Catalina Island, Joshua Tree, and they found a great pool in the San Mateo wilderness of the Cleveland National Forest. One of the kids said, this is the best day of my life. A huge part of our outreach are the cams that Peter's operated since 2008. They've been viewed by thousands all over the world, and he's built a community of people who regularly visit our website. Unfortunately, there was a beehive in the owl cavity this year, but he's trying to get a beekeeper to remove it. Applied research is also integrated into outreach through volunteer scientists. All of our volunteers have been trained on Star Ranch. Hundreds of volunteers have helped us track climate change effects, monitor birds, remove weeds. Volunteers helped our biologists do stream bioassessment. Um, here they're taking creek samples to look at the larger invertebrates, some of which can tolerate pollution and some can't. Here the volunteers are taking samples from a creek that flows into Star Ranch from the adjacent golf course community. And here you can see Bell Creek in the turquoise and the point at which the runoff comes from Dove Creek from the golf courses and also Tick Creek. About 11, longer than 11 years ago now, I think, um, after, um, no, about actually it was about 11 years of working with a hydrologist engineer in the adjacent community. Peter had two large pumps installed to pump the polluted creek water into the water districts for recycling. So we're going to look at results from stream bioassessment, but first, in case you don't know, I wanted to tell you about Index of Biological Integrity, or IBI, which measure, measures wetland responses to pollution using macroinvertebrates. The higher the score, the higher the uh, likelihood of a healthy wetland. And here's a graph showing the water quality as measured by macroinvertebrates or the creek buds with bugs with different pollution tolerances. The y-axis is the IBI score, and the blue line is Bell Creek, which from 2003 to 2016 stayed in the fair to good zone. But the other color lines are Bell Creek south of the runoff and the tributaries from the golf course which stayed in the poor to very poor range over the same time period. Volunteers have also helped with aquatic vertebrate monitoring, tree frogs, two different species, California newt, southwestern pond turtle, and arroyo chub, a California species of special concern, a fish. These animals need water, water all year, so in the fall, at the end of the dry season, we surveyed for perennial pools. Star Ranch Bird Observatory, avian monitoring integrated into education programs that stimulate an interest in birds and conservation of bird habitat. From 1999 to 2020, we offered bird banding workshops, both beginning in advance every March. And from 1999 to 2020, our MAPS banding station was operated by ornithologists and volunteers during breeding season, and they monitored neotropical migrants or songbirds that migrate to and from the Western Hemisphere tropics. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we send our data to our partners at Institute for Bird Populations. <clears throat> From 2005 to 2020, our ornithologists and volunteers banded birds in winter to monitor overwintering survival of neotropical migrants on their wintering grounds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our data are Santa Institute for Bird Population, but we also looked at star ranch trends over time. I'm not going to go through this. I keep our seasonal ornithologist madly busy in the spring. Just ask Zach Vickers, who is here right now. He's monitoring birds of needlegrass grasslands, coastal sage scrub, oak and riparian woodlands, and the hawks and owls of Bell Canyon. And this is the kind of thing we do with our results. These are results from a while back um, on coastal California gnat catcher territories on Star Ranch. He's still, he's in the midst of those surveys right now. 
a little bit on sustainability. We're sustainable in that we're cost effective. Our seasonal staff live on site and we're sustainable because we use no chemicals. So we're getting towards the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about our partnerships. New environmental challenges, as you know, in the Southern California region rely on collaboration with partners to promote conservation, protect people, and rare habitats. In 2009, with a partner from Rancho Mission Viejo Reserves, Laura Eisenberg, we started the South County Fire Watch. The Orange County Fire Authority trains new volunteers every year. We now have over 150 who go out to their lookouts during red flag warnings in the fall during high winds to serve as lookouts and deterrents. The Southern California Emerging Tree Pest Working Group began meeting bi-weekly via, con via conference call in 2015. There are scientists, agencies, major Southern California preserves and others who report on borer beetles and work to monitor and remove them. Coast is a really critical partnership. It's an Orange County Fire Prevention co Collaborative. Over 50 of us from CAL FIRE, Orange County Fire Authority, the major preserves, Southern California Edison, agencies and universities meet, well, right now it's bi-monthly, and we produced a community wildfire protection plan. Now some partnerships with academic and agency researchers, uh, the UC Davis Cougar Research Project, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on Arroyo Chubbs, State Water Quality Control Board Bioassessment, or those creek macroinvertebrates checking water quality. Stormwater Monitoring Coalition has a, have assessed stream flow. And the University of California Cooperative Extension has looked at tree pests. Talk a little bit about tree pests and diseases in Southern California, the shot hole borers. Gold spotted oak borer, or GSOB, and invasive shot hole borer, or ISHOB. In the early 2000s, the, they were first observed in Southern California, and they've spread to, to Orange, San Diego, Riverside, San Bernardino, Ventura, Santa Barbara counties. That's ISHOB anyway. They, the borer beetles via a fungus carried in their adult jaws in the case of ISHOB or larval chewing in the case of GSOB block the tree conducting tubes and growth. Researchers are working on some interesting possible remedies, but you can help by buying local firewood, since firewood is the primary way that these pests spread in infested wood. And for more information, um, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources has some great websites, ishob.org and gsob.org. Okay, I wanted to show you this video. Um, in May of 2022, um, the um, mom mountain lion had three kittens in a den in Crow Canyon on Star Ranch. And so this is one of the videos from their cams. <laughs> so now I'm going to end with a series of photos from former Star Inch wildlife biologist Scott Gibson. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Wow. And a great way to end with those that uh, video there and those photos. Thank you. Okay, if people have questions, open up your chat and put the questions in there. Sandy, are you able to open up the chat and watch 
as things get started there. Um, and, and I'll start, you mentioned briefly then the, the boring insects and associated problems. How serious in Star Ranch is that seem to have leveled off or continuing to grow as an issue? Well, they come out um, just about every month from UC Cooperative Extension, Dr. Beatriz Nobua Behrman, wonderful entomologist who runs that program, uh, along with uh, Dr. John Kabashima. But um, yeah, so the Aisha populations have remained low, but they found some major infestations of GSOB. And Scott Hatch, the, our wildland resource planner from Orange County Fire Authority has been out with contractors. They wanna remove what are called amplifier trees, the trees where they breed and spread from. And um, uh, we don't use chemicals on Star Ranch, but I had to back off Bea, the scientist, talked to me for about an hour, <laughs> convincing me that it was necessary. So they're going to do trunk injections to take a proactive approach against them spreading and kind of like something like 300 feet or something like that out from the amplifier trees. So, yeah, we've got it. Got one of them anyway. And are, is the concern mostly with the Quercus agrifolia? Yeah. Or eat? Okay. That's our really our only oak. Okay, well, go ahead. And if you open up the chat stream, it's maybe you can find some happier subjects to answer questions on. Can um, you do that for me? Certainly. So let's see. R right off the bat, they want to go back to the artichoke thistle. And how are you getting success with that? We and well, tools. we. We use that series of three experiments. It's really important to me to infuse as much rigor as I can to try to take an experimental approach or at least some more informal trials to test. Okay, so what we found was repeated cutting of all the photosynthetic surfaces or the leaves. And we use a treatment interval of the first year that was derived from the first year in experiments, the average. And so the first year we use brush cutters and the crew returns every three weeks and cuts away all photosynthetic surfaces. And by the end of the first year, most sites have that 95% reduction in cover. And then the second year we switch to another <laughs> star inch innovation, so fancy. They're hose with the tips cut off and the edges sharpened. And now the thistle rosettes are more widely spaced and so they, as they're flying through the polygons or the, the, that they work in, they just flip off the re-sprouts. And, um, that's, and the, the time spent in any site is way reduced. And the treatment intervals are widened to four, six, or eight weeks or more, depending on site conditions. And then, of course, there's a whole long list of other non-natives that we're dealing with. And I apologize, I know there are definite ecological definitions for invasive weed, non-native, and I just use them interchangeably. I don't care. We understand, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Was there a difference in macroinvertebrates after the creeks were diverted? Yeah, uh, the, I should let Peter take that. <laughs> but we didn't see an improvement. Do you have an hypothesis for that? For, why no i mean we've been been collecting the runoff are you off mute oh sorry i i, I can hear him oh okay we've we've been collecting the runoff um talking to well, i'm gonna mute myself again we've been collecting the runoff for since 2007 and how that's affected the ecosystem is Sandy's job to figure out, but I just wanted to make sure that we didn't get that urban runoff that kept the hydrology of Bell Canyon wet for 12 months a year when sometimes the canyon would dry up and that extra runoff would promote exotic plants or conditions that would would not be natural. The, the golf course sometimes 
flushes salts and we've just had runoff despite the pumping um, in really high rainfall years the water can't be controlled and it can't be controlled during any kind of rain decent rainfall season so it's not perfect but it's better than it would have been without the pumps mm -hmm. the, the only thing I'd add the only thing I'd add was that it seemed like water 12 months a year was the bigger factor than the water being polluted. It, it just changed the, the whole hydrology of Bell Canyon that normally dried up. That's a, a, a good biggie to start with to know. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Next we have Dan Songster. How long has the junior biologist been going on and how many uh, are there in an average class? So, that was the very first program. I'm a former third grade teacher, and then I was a naturalist. So I, I knew that, that I wanted to start education programs. So I started a junior biologist in 2000. And I should tell you that junior biologists aren't operating post-pandemic um, because with grant grants, I have a seasonal ornithologist. So he's here from this year from January through July. And I just didn't think somebody here that short of time could deal with those heavy duty programs. They take a lot of planning and instruction. So unfortunately, we're not doing junior biologists right now, but I'm really happy with the education programs we're doing. We're getting adults and kids. We had a really cute homeschool group today. They were driving Zach a little bit nuts, <laughs> little kids. So the junior biologist program span from 2000 to the pandemic 2020 oh, okay that's a good long stretch yeah well it was done. fun boy let's see oh we have people that kept coming back with the artichoke thistles uh boy that that is a tough one for people so i'll, I'll kind of combine some of these questions the when you go in how long um are the seeds viable? Because initially you have the seed heads and you have all those seeds and it sounds like your technique uh, takes all the energy out of the roots as well as never allows a seed head to show up, but there's still the seeds. Do you have an idea? Seed in the seed bank? Yeah, right. we actually um, measured seed banks and they're surprisingly short lived. They The seed banks dissipated within several years i don't remember the data now but it, it was surprisingly short uh time period and we never stopped going back to a site i love to get out there still and i go out to we call it treat the older restoration sites and the crew does the tough work and the new work new sites um and so what I'm getting mostly are not seedlings, but re-sprouts here and there oh, in the okay. older restoration sites. The seedlings stopped showing up really soon after we started restoration. That'd be the second year of artichoke thistle control. It was surprising. Do you have um, research that people can get to? Because it seems like that's a hot subject. Yeah. Um, I've published, I don't publish anymore. I, it's just not, I don't like it. <laughs> but I do have some papers on ResearchGate, if you've ever used it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've given some talks on it that are online, I know. Okay. And I, can, I give talks on our invasive species, specifically on our invasive species control and restoration programs. So. Then you're starting to get late. Let's take one more question. If the non-native grass is beneficial for the small native mammals, yet is being colonized by the sage scrub, does that pose any issues? I, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's, well, yeah, you're right. It is beneficial and that it's providing resources, Seeds. food. Mm -hmm. um, but what now was the second part of it? Right. Um, yet is being colonized by the sage scrub does that pose any issues? To... Are, are we losing oh, any, oh, any small value, mammals. really? Yeah. Well, they're seed eaters. This is just a hypothesis. And I just saw Helen de la Massa. No. <laughs> Did you get my card, Helen? I got your card. 
then I didn't. <laughs> we should talk later. <laughs> you should come visit. Um, Helen used to work here long, ancient times. Um, so oh, oh seed eaters. So, yeah, the coastal sage crab, for, you know, there are plenty of seeds there is my hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I don't know if more, but. Hmm? And maybe there, um, no, there's not a turnover really in the species, but. Right, and it seemed like the, the grass. That's an interesting showed. question. Sure, the small uh, mammals did fine also as uh, things progressed. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Let's give Sandy a big clap, whether it's on emoticons or clapping up here or unmuting yourself and, and saying things um, and clapping. Thank you very much, Sandy. This is good, good talk. Thank you. It was fun. Come visit. <laughs> we have claps. We have thumbs up. See hands waving up. Very good. Very good. Okay, I think we are done for the night. Unless anyone has a final question, something to close it up. It's a nice way to finish the night. I am three time zones away, so I'd be, I'm, um, be glad to, to say good night to everyone. <laughs> good night. It's like we're good. Okay. Bye good night. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.